Samuel de Champlain. Samuel de Champlain, known as the father of New France, was a French settler, navigator, cartographer, draftsman, soldier, explorer, geographer, ethnologist, diplomat, and chronicler. He made from 21 to 29 trips across the Atlantic, and founded New France and Quebec City on July 3, 1608. He is important to Canadian history because he made the first accurate map of the coast and he helped had found the settlements. Born into a family of mariners, Champlain, while still a young boy, began exploring North America in 1603 under the guidance of François Grave Dupont, his uncle. From 1604 to 1607, Champlain participated in the exploration and settlement of the first permanent European settlement north of Florida, Port Royal, Acadia as well as the first European settlement that would become St. John, New Brunswick. Then, in 1608, he established the French settlement that is now Quebec City, Canada. Champlain was the first European to explore and describe the Great Lakes, and published maps of his journeys and accounts of what he learned from the natives and the French living among the natives. He formed relationships with local Montagnier and Inu and later with others farther west, with Algonquin and with Wendat, and agreed to provide assistance in the Beaver Wars against the Iroquois. In 1620, Louis XIII of France ordered Champlain to cease exploration, return to Quebec, and devote himself to the administration of the country. In every way but formal title, Samuel de Champlain served as governor of New France a title that may have been formally unavailable to him owing to his non-noble status. He established trading companies that sent goods, primarily fur, to France, and oversaw the growth of New France in the St. Lawrence River Valley until his death in 1635. Champlain is memorialized as the father of New France and father of Acadia, and many places, streets, and structures in northeastern North America bear his name, or have monuments established in his memory. The most notable of these is Lake Champlain, which straddles the border between northern New York and Vermont, extending slightly across the border into Canada. In 1609 he led an expedition up the Richelieu River and explored a long, narrow lake situated between the Green Mountains of present-day Vermont and the Adirondack Mountains of present-day New York. He named the lake after himself as the first European to map and describe it. Champlain was born to Antoine Champlain and Marguerite Leroy, in either Hyers Brouage, or the port city of La Rochelle in the French province of Oni. He was born on or before August 13, 1574, according to a recent baptism record found by Jean-Marie Germ, French genealogist. Although in 1870, the Canadian Catholic priest Lavardier, in the first chapter of his Oeuvres de Champlain, accepted Pierre Damien Rengue's estimate and tried to justify it, his calculations were based on assumptions now believed, or proven, to be incorrect. Although Léopold de Lay wrote as early as 1867 that Rengue's estimate was wrong, the books of Rengue and Lavardier have had a significant influence. The 1567 date was carved on numerous monuments dedicated to Champlain and is widely regarded as accurate. In the first half of the 20th century, some authors disagreed, choosing 1570 or 1575 instead of 1567. In 1978 Jean Liebel published groundbreaking research about these estimates of Champlain's birth year and concluded, Samuel Champlain was born about 1580 in Brouage, France. Liebel asserts that some authors, including the Catholic priests Rengueit and Lavardier, preferred years when Brouage was under Catholic control. Champlain claimed to be from Brouage in the title of his 1603 book and to be saint Hongues in the title of his second book. He belonged to either a Protestant family, or a tolerant Roman Catholic one, since Brouage was most of the time a Catholic city in a Protestant region, and his Old Testament first name was not usually given to Catholic children. The exact location of his birth is thus also not known with certainty, but at the time of his birth his parents were living in Brouage. Born into a family of mariners, Samuel Champlain learned to navigate, draw, make nautical charts, and write practical reports. His education did not include ancient Greek or Latin, so he did not read or learn from any ancient literature. As each French fleet had to assure its own defense at sea, Champlain sought to learn to fight with the firearms of his time. He acquired this practical knowledge when serving with the army of King Henry IV during the later stages of France's religious wars in Brittany from 1594 or 1595 to 1598, beginning as a quartermaster responsible for the feeding and care of horses. During this time he claimed to go on a certain secret voyage for the king, and saw combat. 
By 1597 he was a Capitaine d'une Compagnie serving in a garrison near Campere. In 1598, his uncle-in-law, a navigator whose ship San Julian was chartered to transport Spanish troops to Cadiz pursuant to the Treaty of Vervins, gave Champlain the opportunity to accompany him. After a difficult passage, he spent some time in Cadiz before his uncle, whose ship was then chartered to accompany a large Spanish fleet to the West Indies, again offered him a place on the ship. His uncle, who gave command of the ship to Geronimo de Villiprera, instructed the young Champlain to watch over the ship. This journey lasted two years, and gave Champlain the opportunity to see or hear about Spanish holdings from the Caribbean to Mexico City. Along the way he took detailed notes, and wrote an illustrated report on what he learned on this trip, and gave this secret report to King Henry, who rewarded Champlain with an annual pension. This report was published for the first time in 1870, by La Verdier, as brief discours des choses plus remarquables que Samuel Champlain de Berwage reconnaissant Occidentals occidentals au voyage qu'il en a fait ten i sets en l'année 1599 et en l'année 1601, comme en suite. The authenticity of this account as a work written by Champlain has frequently been questioned, due to inaccuracies and discrepancies with other sources in a number of points, however, recent scholarship indicates that the work probably was authored by Champlain. On Champlain's return to Cadiz in August 1600, his uncle, who had fallen ill, asked him to look after his business affairs. This Champlain did, and when his uncle died in June 1601, Champlain inherited his substantial estate. It included an estate near La Rochelle, commercial properties in Spain, and a 150 ton merchant ship. This inheritance, combined with the king's annual pension, gave the young explorer a great deal of independence as he was not dependent on the financial backing of merchants and other investors. From 1601 to 1603 Champlain served as a geographer in the court of King Henry IV. As part of his duties he traveled to French ports and learned much about North America from the fishermen that seasonally traveled to coastal areas from Nantucket to Newfoundland to capitalize on the rich fishing grounds there. He also made a study of previous French failures at colonization in the area, including that of Pierre de Chauvin at Tadoussac. When Chauvin forfeited his monopoly on fur trade in North America in 1602, responsibility for renewing the trade was given to Imer de Chaste. Champlain approached de Chaste about a position on the first voyage, which he received with the king's assent. Champlain's first trip to North America was as an observer on a fur trading expedition led by Francois Grave Dupont. Dupont was a navigator and merchant who had been a ship's captain on Chauvin's expedition and with whom Champlain established a firm lifelong friendship. He educated Champlain about navigation in North America, including the St. Lawrence River, and in dealing with the natives there. The Bon Renome arrived at Tadoussac on March 15, 1603. Champlain was anxious to see for himself all of the places that Jacques Cartier had seen and described about 60 years earlier, and wanted to go even further than Cartier, if possible. Champlain created a map of the St. Lawrence in this trip and, after his return to France on September 20, published an account as Des Sauvages, Au Voyage de Samuel Champlain, The Bruages, Fête en la France Nouvelle Lon 1603. Included in his account were meetings with Bigarat, a chief of the Montagnais at Tadoussac, in which positive relationships were established between the French and the many Montagnais gathered there, with some Algonquin friends. Promising to King Henry to report on further discoveries, Champlain joined a second expedition to New France in the spring of 1604. This trip, once again an exploratory journey without women and children, lasted several years, and focused on areas south of the St. Lawrence River, in what later became known as Acadia. It was led by Pierre Dugua de Mons, a noble and Protestant merchant who had been given a fur trading monopoly in New France by the king. Dugua asked Champlain to find a site for a winter settlement. After exploring possible sites in the Bay of Fundy, Champlain selected St. Proy Island in the St. Proy River as the site of the expedition's first winter settlement. After enduring a harsh winter on the island settlement was relocated across the bay where they established Port Royal. Until 1607, Champlain used that site as his base, while he explored the Atlantic coast. Dugua was forced to leave the settlement for France in September 1605 because he learned that his monopoly was at risk. His monopoly was rescinded by the king in July 1607 under pressure from other merchants and proponents of free trade, leading to the abandonment of the settlement. In 1605 and 1606, Champlain explored the North American coast as far south as Cape Cod, 
searching for sites for a permanent settlement. Minor skirmishes with the resident Nauseats dissuaded him from the idea of establishing one near present day Chatham, Massachusetts. He named the area Malibar. In the spring of 1608, Douglas wanted Champlain to start a new French colony and fur trading center on the shores of the St. Lawrence. Douglas equipped, at his own expense, a fleet of three ships with workers, that left the French port of Onflor. The main ship, called the Dante Hugh, was commanded by Champlain. Another ship, the Lavrier, was commanded by his friend Dupont. The small group of male settlers arrived at Tadoussac on the lower St. Lawrence in June. Because of the dangerous strength of the Saguenay River ending there, they left the ships and continued up the big river in small boats, bringing them in and the materials. On July 3, 1608, Champlain landed at the point of Quebec and set about fortifying the area by the erection of three main wooden buildings, each two stories tall, that he collectively called the habitation, with a wooden stockade and a moat wide surrounding them. This was the very beginning of Quebec City. Gardening, exploring, and fortifying this place became great passions of Champlain for the rest of his life. In the 1620s, the habitation at Quebec was mainly a store for the Compagnie des Marchands, and Champlain lived in the wooden Fort St. Louis newly built up the hill, near the only two houses built by the two settler families. In May 1610, King Henry was assassinated in Paris by a Catholic fanatic, and rule fell to his wife, Marie de Medici, as regent for the nine-year-old Louis XIII. Marie was a staunch Catholic with little interest in New France and many of Champlain's Protestant financial supporters, including Pierre Dugua de Mons, were denied access to court. Champlain, on hearing the news, returned to France in September 1610 to establish new political connections in support of efforts at colonization. One route Champlain may have chosen to improve his access to the court of the regent was his decision to enter into marriage with the 12-year-old Hélène Boulay. She was the daughter of Nicolas Boulay, a man charged with carrying out royal decisions at court. The marriage contract was signed on December 27, 1610 in presence of Dugua, who had dealt with the father, and the couple was married three days later. The terms of the contract called for the marriage to be consummated two years later. Champlain sought permission from her parents to consummate the marriage before that, many of those who entered into such relationships, such as Samuel de Champlain, the first governor of French Canada, agreed that they would not have sex with a 12-year-old Brity until she was 14 as Champlain did unless he consulted with her family and received their permission to do so earlier. Apparently, he did. Champlain's marriage was initially quite troubled, as Ellen rallied against joining him in August 1613. Their relationship, while it apparently lacked any physical connection, recovered and was apparently good for many years. Ellen lived in Quebec for several years, but returned to Paris and eventually decided to enter a convent. The couple had no children, Although Champlain did adopt three Montagnier girls named Faith, Hope, and Charity in the winter of 1627-28. During the summer of 1609, Champlain attempted to form better relations with the local native tribes. He made alliances with the Wendat and with the Algonquin, the Montagnier and the Echemon, who lived in the area of the St. Lawrence River. These tribes demanded that Champlain help them in their war against the Iroquois, who lived farther south. Champlain set off with nine French soldiers and 300 natives to explore the Riviere des Iroquois, and became the first European to map Lake Champlain. Having had no encounters with the Haudenosaunee at this point, many of the men headed back, leaving Champlain with only two Frenchmen and 60 natives. On July 29, somewhere in the area near Ticonderoga and Crown Point, New York, Champlain and his party encountered a group of Haudenosaunee. In a battle begun the next day, 250 Haudenosaunee advanced on Champlain's position, and one of his guides pointed out the three chiefs. In his account of the battle, Champlain recounts Viringa's arquebus and killing two of them with a single shot, after which one of his men killed the third. The Haudenosaunee turned and fled. This action set the tone for poor French Iroquois relations for the rest of the century. The Battle of Sorel occurred on June 19, 1610 with Samuel de Champlain supported by the Kingdom of France and his allies, the Wendat people, Algonquin people and Innu people against the Mohawk people in New France at present-day Sorel Tracy, Quebec. The forces of Champlain armed with the arquebus engaged and slaughtered or captured nearly all of the Mohawks. The battle ended major hostilities with the Mohawks for 20 years. On March 29, 1613, arriving back in New France, he first ensured that his new royal commission be proclaimed. 
Champlain set out on May 27 to continue his exploration of the Huron country and in hopes of finding the northern sea he had heard about. He traveled the Ottawa River, later giving the first description of this area. Along the way, he apparently dropped or left behind a cache of silver cups, copper oak kettles, and a brass astrolabe dated 1603, which was later found by a farm boy named Edward Lee near Copton, Ontario. It was in June that he met with Tesswat, the Algonquin chief of Alomet Island, and offered to build the tribe a fort if they were to move from Theria they occupied, with its poor soil, to the locality of the Lachine Rapids. By August 26, Champlain was back in Saint Malo. There, he wrote an account of his life from 1604 to 1612 and his journey up the Ottawa River, his voyages and published another map of New France. In 1614, he formed the Compagnie des Marchands de Rouen at the Saint-Malo in Compagnie Champlain, which bound the Rouen and Saint-Malo merchants for eleven years. He returned to New France in the spring of 1615 with four recollects in order to further religious life in the new colony. The Roman Catholic Church was eventually given and seigneury large and valuable tracts of land, estimated at nearly 30% of all the lands granted by the French crown in New France. Champlain continued to work to improve relations with the natives, promising to help them in their struggles against the Iroquois. With his native guides, he explored further up the Ottawa River and reached Lake Nipissing. He then followed the French River until he reached the freshwater sea he called Lacataiguata. In 1615, Champlain was escorted through the area that is now Peterborough, Ontario by a group of Wendat. He used the ancient portage between Shemong Lake and Little Lake and stayed for a short period of time near what is now Bridge North. On September 1, 1615, at Kayak, he and the northern tribes started a military expedition against the Iroquois. The party passed Lake Ontario at its eastern tip where they hid their canoes and continued their journey by land. They followed the Oneida River until they arrived at the main Onondaga Fort on October 10. The exact location of this place is still a matter of debate. Although the traditional location, Nichols Pond, is regularly disproved by professional and amateur archaeologists, many still claim that Nichols Pond is the location of the battle. South of Canastota, New York. Champlain attacked the stockaded Oneida village. He was accompanied by ten Frenchmen and three hundred Wendat. Pressured by the Huron Wendat to attack prematurely, the assault failed. Champlain was wounded twice in the leg by arrows, one in his knee. The conflict ended on October 16 when the French Wendat were forced to flee. Although he did not want to, the Wendat insisted that Champlain spend the winter with them. During his stay, he set off with them in their great deer hunt during which he became lost and was forced to wander for three days living off game and sleeping under trees until he met up with a band of First Nations people be chance. He spent the rest of the winter learning their country, their manners, customs, modes of life. On May 22, 1616, he left the Wendat country and returned to Quebec before heading back to France on July 2. Champlain returned to New France in 1620 and was to spend the rest of his life focusing on administration of the territory rather than exploration. Champlain spent the winter building forts on the Wee on top of Cape Diamond. By mid May, he learned that the fur trading monopoly had been handed over to another company led by the Kahn brothers. After some tense negotiations, it was decided to merge the two companies under the direction of the Kahn's. Champlain continued to work on relations with the natives and managed to impose on them a chief of his choice. He also negotiated a peace treaty with the Iroquois. Champlain continued to work on the fortifications of what became Quebec City, laying the first stone on May 6, 1624. On August 15, he once again returned to France, where he was encouraged to continue his work as well as to continue looking for a passage to China, something widely believed to exist at the time. By July 5, he was back at Quebec and continued expanding the city. In 1627 the Kahn Brothers Company lost its monopoly on the fur trade, and Cardinal Richelieu formed the Compagnie des Saints Associés de Manager the Fur Trade. Champlain was one of the 100 investors, and its first fleet, loaded with colonists and supplies, set sail in April 1628. Champlain had overwintered in Quebec. Supplies were low, and English merchants pillaged Cap Tormenté in early July 1628. A war had broken out between France and England and Charles I of England had issued letters of marque that authorized the capture of French shipping and its colonies in North America. Champlain received a summons to surrender on July 10 from some heavily armed, English-based Scottish merchants, the Kirk brothers. Champlain refused to deal with them, misleading them to believe that Quebec's defenses were better than they actually were. 
successfully bluffed, they withdrew, but encountered and captured the French supply fleet, cutting off that year's supplies to the colony. By the spring of 1629 supplies were dangerously low and Champlain was forced to send people to Gaspé and into Indian communities to conserve rations. On July 19, the Kirk brothers arrived before Quebec after intercepting Champlain's plea for help, and Champlain was forced to surrender the colony. Many colonists were taken first to England and then to France by the Kirks, but Champlain remained in London to begin the process of regaining the colony. A peace treaty had been signed in April 1629 three months before the surrender, and, under the terms of that treaty, Quebec and other prizes were taken by the Kirks after the treaty was supposed to be returned out it was not until the 1632 Treaty of saint germain en laye that Quebec was formally given back to France. Champlain reclaimed his role as commander of New France on behalf of Richelieu on March 1, 1633, having served in the intervening years as commander in New France in the absence of my lord the Cardinal de Richelieu from 1629 to 1635. In 1632 Champlain published Voyages de la Nouvelle France, which was dedicated to Cardinal Richelieu, and Traité de la Marine et du Devoir d'un bon marinier, a treatise on leadership, seamanship, and navigation. Champlain returned to Quebec on May 22, 1633, after an absence of four years. Richelieu gave him a commission as lieutenant general of New France, along with other titles and responsibilities, but not that of governor. Despite this lack of formal status, many colonists, French merchants, and Indians treated him as if he had the title, writings survive in which he is referred to as our governor. On August 18, 1634, he sent a report to Richelieu stating that he had rebuilt on the ruins of Quebec, enlarged its fortifications, and established two more habitations. One was 15 leagues upstream, and the other was at Trois Rivières. He also began an offensive against the Iroquois, reporting that he wanted them either wiped out or brought to reason. Champlain had a severe stroke in October 1635, and died on December 25, leaving no immediate heirs. Jesuit records state he died in the care of his friend and confessor Charles Lolman. Although his will gave much of his French property to his wife Ellen, he made significant bequests to the Catholic missions and to individuals in the colony of Quebec. However, Marie Camaret, a cousin on his mother's side, challenged the will in Paris and had it successfully overturned. It is unclear exactly what happened to his estate. Samuel de Champlain was temporarily buried in the church while a standalone chapel was built to hold his remains in the upper part of the city. Unfortunately, this small building, along with many others, was destroyed by a large fire in 1640. Though immediately rebuilt, no traces of it exist anymore. His exact burial site is still unknown, despite much research since about 1850, including several archaeological digs in the city. There is general agreement that the previous Champlain Chapel site, and the remains of Champlain, should be somewhere near the Notre Dame de Quebec Cathedral. The search for Champlain's remains supplies a key plot line in the crime writer Louise Penny's 2010 novel, Bury Your Dead. Many sites and landmarks have been named to honor Champlain, who remains, to this day, a prominent historical figure in many parts of Acadia, Ontario, Quebec, New York, and Vermont. They include These are works that were written by Champlain. Note citations. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.